Now let's consider the first of the two major parts of the Mass, the Liturgy of the Word. The assembled people, prepared by the celebration of the introductory rites, now listen to God's Word. Through His Word, God enters our life today. The aim of the Liturgy of the Word is to proclaim the Word of God and elicit a response of faith from the people. The Liturgy of the Word has always been closely connected with the celebration of the Eucharist. The first act of the Liturgy of the Word is the proclamation of the first reading. Now, I'm going to use the Sunday celebration as our model as we go through the parts of the Liturgy of the Word because weekday celebrations are slightly abbreviated. So we begin the Liturgy of the Word with the first reading, which is taken from the Old Testament most of the time. You know, there's a continuity between Old and New Testaments, both focusing on the Kingdom of God. Christians cannot fully understand the New Testament presentation of Jesus unless they reflect on the Old. This first reading often follows the same theme as the Gospel reading. Now, during the Easter season, the reading is always taken from the Acts of the Apostles. And at the end of the proclamation of the first reading, a period of silence should be observed. After that silence, we enter into our responsorial psalm, which is intended to be a peaceful and meditative response to God's Word. The responsorial psalm and its proclamation at this time follows the pattern of the synagogue at the time of Jesus, when the readings of Scripture were followed by the singing of psalms. And it is ideal that the responsorial psalm be sung, even if it has to be adapted somewhat. Then there's the second reading. The second reading is taken from the New Testament. Most of the books of the New Testament, we know, are letters. And while addressed originally to a particular situation in the early church communities, the message of these writings, these letters, transcends the centuries to motivate contemporary Christians and to deepen our appreciation of the mystery of Christ. A continuous reading from week to week during ordinary time is the pattern followed in the second reading. So don't expect the second reading to correspond to the theme of the first reading and the gospel. The second reading is a continuous reading from week to week during ordinary time as we go through most of the various books of the New Testament. Now during special seasons such as Lent, Easter, or Advent, Christmas, these second readings are specially selected. The proclamation of the second reading should also be followed by a period of silence. And then the people stand for the Alleluia or Gospel acclamation. We make this acclamation usually in song to proclaim the most wonderful deed of God among humanity, Jesus Christ, visually symbolized by the Gospel book held high by the presider or deacon. This acclamation comes from about the 4th or 5th centuries, and it really should be sung, and it may be omitted if it's not sung. Many liturgists see this as a processional song, implying that some form of procession with the Gospel book should take place. And then we have the proclamation of the Gospel. The proclamation of the Gospel is the focal point of the Liturgy of the Word. And this proclamation of the Gospel goes all the way back to Justin Martyr around the time of the second century or even earlier. And the proclamation of the gospel is reserved to those sharing in the sacrament of holy orders. Following the proclamation of the gospel, there should be a homily. It used to be called a sermon. The homily is an integral part of the liturgy and a necessary source of nourishment of the Christian life. Liturgists tell us that this should be a homily, an exhortation based on liturgical texts, usually the scriptural texts used in the celebration, rather than a sermon based on a pious subject. And as I say, it should be an exhortation. It's not primarily a moment of teaching, although inevitably teaching will occur in such an exhortation. But it's really intended to help the people to connect the liturgy of the word with the living of their lives, and then as such, it is an exhortation. The ministry of preaching is basic to the mission of the church, and the homily is as much a part of the praying together as anything else, and it too should be followed by silence. 
Then on Sundays and solemnities, we stand and together profess our faith by using a creed. Creeds are symbols of faith. They are written professions of faith, summarizing the faith community's search for an ever-deepening understanding of Jesus and his message. The original use of the creed was, a, was as a profession of faith for those to be baptized during the Easter Vigil. The creed was introduced into the celebration of Mass during the 6th century. And then the Liturgy of the Word is concluded with the universal prayer or the prayers of the faithful. These prayers are of Jewish origin, and they reflect a simple, direct, personal approach to God. Through them, the people petition God for the needs of the church, society, their own parish, persons in need, the sick and suffering, and those who have died. The universal prayer coming at the end of the Liturgy of the Word is a faith-filled statement of trust in all that God has told us and done.